Wait, the robots change shifts? Everyone deserves a break, Loggle. New deal for animation, baby! The final arc of Amphibia continues as we return to a very different Wartwood, one that's transformed into a robot slaying resistance, ready to take down King Andreas. But do they know what awaits them on the other side? And can we talk about Sasha's new look? Of course we can! This is our breakdown of Amphibia Season 3's Commander Anne and Sprivey. And to stay in the loop of all things Amphibia and Owl House, as we bust our butts off to get you these breakdowns as soon as possible, please be sure to give this video a like and subscribe to the roundtable with notifications on so you never miss a video. Let's get this show on the road! Picking up from last week's episode, Anne and the Planters are horrified to arrive in an amphibia that looks very different from the one they remember. Andreas' robot army is in full force as he continues to terraform the planet, mining for resources. There's excess toxic waste, and homes are being destroyed by newer robot models. The inclusion of a villager running for his life as his home is bulldozed is played for laughs, but it's a detail that shows how Andreas really doesn't care for the people of Amphibia. The Newts and Utopia were sent in a panic when when the castle ascended in true colors. We already saw Andreas had no interest in his political duties back in the first temple, which involved the toads, and he had no gripes with sending a killer robot to Wartwood just to eradicate Sasha and Grime. At this point, his mission of restoring glory to Utopia doesn't have anything to do with improving Amphibia itself. It has everything to do with getting his invasion underway, spreading the Utopia empire throughout the multiverse. And at that point, what does it matter if Amphibia is trashed? Utopia can just set up shop on one of the infinite amount of planets. Scary hours. Now, earlier in the season, I was somewhat disappointed that we didn't have Andrea send more robots to Earth. I loved the Monster of the Week format we seem to have in the New Normal, Turning Point, Fight at the Museum, Temple Frogs, and Anstorminator. Including Froggy Little Christmas, and I guess the robot arm and spider sprig, a majority of this season did feature Andreas' robots as antagonists. But I guess with a majority of that being cloakbot appearances, I was hoping to see different variations. But this week's batch did a great job of telling us that they aren't done with rolling out different bots for our heroes to turn to scrap metal. They just wanted us to be back in Amphibia first, where the entire vibe is different. I mean, we got the Beetlebots, Dark Frobos, and another bug based robot whose name escapes me and my descriptive skills combined with Google isn't helping. Is it just another beetle? I don't know. Bug experts, sound off in the comments, please. The family returns to Wartwood, which is in ruin following the events of Turning Point, and it isn't long before they're ambushed by the local wildlife, which is being mind controlled through the spores. A lot of Season 1 elements are starting to come back into play here. If you remember, the spores of a rare mind controlling mushrooms were a part of a potion that Hop Hop used on the kids to try to get them to listen to him, which was met with very ad first reactions. Now, these spores are being used to not only keep the wildlife under Andrews' control, but I imagine the spores could have been useful in developing the core's hive mind, and the technology that transformed Marcy into Darcy. Anne and the gang are saved by Sasha Waybright, Wally, Mrs. Croker, and Loggle. Wally and Mrs. Croker are armored up, and Loggle got some absolute gains going. Sasha's reached her final evolution, letting her hair completely grow out, no longer being held up in a ponytail, which could reflect Sasha no longer keeping a guard up around Anne, letting herself be completely vulnerable, open, and honest. She has a brand new shoulder pad, a flowing dark cape, what looks like her original brown armor repurposed with the touches of the scarlet armor. However, it's also worth noting the blue on her gloves, boots, and top of her helmet. Although red or pink has always been Sasha's signature color in relation to the Calamity Stone, blue has always been Anne's. Thus, the blue here represents Anne's influence on Sasha. It represents how Sasha is trying to better herself, letting go of her toxic ways for Anne. She also has noticeable muscle definition. Everyone was getting their gains while Anne was away. Continuing the trend of Season 1 elements coming back into play, recontextualizing to fit what the story has become, Sasha reveals that the Planter family tunnels have been transformed into the base of operations for the Frog Rebellion. The village of Wartwood has been recreated in this underground society. Grub and Go has morbidly become Grub and Gone, alongside Stumpy's Diner and other locations having a presence in this hub. Grime, still wearing his scarlet armor, although it's now fading in color, is training the youth in combat, something that may be further elaborated on in the episode Grime's Pupil. Fun Easter egg, Cloud Stripe's Buster Sword from Final Fantasy VII is spotted in the Take a Weapon, Leave a Weapon pile, next to a site that I assume is another reference, but I just don't recognize. Sasha informs Anne that Marcy 
Cersei is alive and kept prisoner, putting Anne's worries at ease. Which kind of makes me wish we did get a scene of Anne expressing her fears over her friends prior, but at least we got some acknowledgement here. Although, it is clear Sasha is unaware that Marcy is simultaneously a prisoner and a second in command. Sort of, uh, actually would it be more like mastermind? Since Andrea serves the core? Either way, it greatly parallels Sasha's own journey while also being a reversal of such. Sasha went from being a prisoner to a second in command to commander. Marcy was kind of second in command, then commander. Except, whereas Sasha manipulated her way up the toad ranks, Marcy was manipulated by Andreas the entire time, ultimately having no say in anything that's happened to her. Sasha pawns off the title of commander to Anne, trying to steer clear of taking control, as their track record shows that that tends to end poorly, but what Sasha fails to recognize here is her intentions. Before, she wanted to control Anne and Marcy so everything could go her way. The best interest of those around Sasha wasn't her top priority, only hers. But it is now. That's the key difference. But she has to reach that conclusion the hard way. Despite Anne being vocal from the start, that Sasha would make a way better commander, and this is a lot of pressure to spring on someone who was just tanning on the beach a few days ago. Sasha's war room is reminiscent of her old room in Toad Tower, as seen in Reunion, with her statue from there present in the background. There's a cute moment where the planters show their newfound habits from Earth, Polly suggesting they ride share to their mission, Hop Hop concerned over germy hands, and Sprig remedying that dilemma with hand sanitizer. Just as Amphibia changed Dan, Earth changed her frog family. Grime tries to reason with Sasha, although he's pretty salty during the exchange, mentioning how he's demoted once more. Going from captain to second in command to general? I don't know how frog war stuff works. For now, he's just grimly demoted. A moment of silence. Sasha retorts to Grind that her complicated relationship with Anne is why Anne's commander, leading to an intense close-up, which shows that apparently, Sasha naturally has blue eyes. During the course of the mission, Anne slips back into her classic amphibia appearance, losing a shoe in the quicksand and getting her hair messy enough to have another branch stick out of the top with leaves decorating the front. But given that leaves and sticks sprouted out of her hair when she first transformed into Calamity Anne, I still believe this appearance signifies that connection to the stone and thus, ending up in this state is an inevitability. The inclusion of the leaf on the pink frog in the Season 3B trailer may also support this theory. After Anne and Sasha have two separate heart-to-heart -heart conversations and successfully complete their mission, the two are finally on good terms, hopefully for good. Sasha reclaiming the title of commander, much to Anne and the Wardwood Resistance's relief. Hop Hop hilariously points out that Anne lost a shoe as the gang heads back to home base. The episode concluding on a shot of Utopia Castle standing tall in the sky as robots deploy. The comedy contrasting with the ominous visual, signifying that hope and levity lives on even in this extremely bleak time. Before we move into Spritey, we have this week's fan spotlight. Hit it! much less to say about Spryvy, but I did find it to be a very enjoyable episode that managed to fit in a episodic story while still pushing forward the overarching narrative. We get a good look at how the Resistance has adapted to the underground life. They're still able to maintain a normal-ish day-to-day, eating meals at Grub and Gone, Toad still is caught up in a grand illusion of wealth despite their economy crashing, and their currency being worthless. Frogs can still get their hair cut by Fern, a character who hasn't appeared since Season 1, debuting in the episode Girl Time, now rocking Kill a Kill scissors. 
Speaking of anime references, the drill necklace from Gurren Lagann appears in the giant panning shot at the start of the episode. And lastly, the frogs are able to still frolic and enjoy nature through paths in the underground tunnels. A wealthy elite, who turns out to be Wally's father, is attempting to deliver goods and resources to the resistance, which leads to their next mission, taking out the cannon that would prevent such a delivery from happening. We called the Riveton family assisting Wartwood in the endgame back in 2020 on our breakdown of the episode Swap and Sensibility. Nice! Since Grime mentions that Wigbert is an elite who's pro-resistance, it makes me wonder if there's other prestige families out there who are supporting Andreas and his robot army because they either align with his ideals or are too afraid to say no. Something that very much happens with the rich in real life. I love Amphibia's world building so much. This episode is pretty straightforward. Sprig and Ivy can't be apart from each other for more than a few minutes and put their mission in jeopardy after tricking Fern and Stumpy to switch places as partners, only to get trapped and nearly lose their lives. These two cannot let their relationship dictate every decision they make. Luckily, they land safely on their feet. We do learn why Sasha assigned these four particular frogs, which makes me appreciate the creativity of the writing team deeply. Sasha needed two of their best commandos to protect two of their best specialists. And because of his metal body parts, Stumpy can conduct electricity, which is a pretty awesome application of his character. Given how this episode ends rather suddenly, I think we're going to be in full swing serialization for the rest of the series. Having every episode pick up shortly after the last to which i say bring it on and with that our breakdown comes to a close as always we want to know what you guys thought about this week's batch of episodes how do you feel about ann and sasha's reconciliation do you think they'll elaborate upon it as the season continues drop your thoughts in the comments below or keep the conversation going on twitter and instagram at roundtablevids and at ostrich thank you for watching and i hope you have a great day see ya